Hey there and welcome to DIY Projects with Pete. In today's episode we're going to build a backyard hockey rink. Now this is the third year in a row we've built the rink and every year we learn a little bit more about what it takes to build and maintain a rink. And while it is a lot of work it's definitely well worth it just to see everybody come out to enjoy it and the smiles it puts on everybody's faces. Now this year came with its fair share of challenges with all the wind, the snow, the extreme cold and warm temperatures. Um, so we're going to go into what it takes to maintain a backyard rink. Now if you enjoy the video, please consider giving it a thumbs up and subscribing to the channel. And I'd love to hear about your experiences with backyard rinks or just with hockey in general, so please comment below. All right, let's go ahead and get started with today's project. Now looking back over the years, year one was all about leveling out an area in the foothills of the Rocky Mountains that had a six foot difference from one side to the other and building a 40 by 80 foot backyard rink. Year two was about expanding the rink to 120 feet long by 60 feet wide. We had to dig out the south end of the rink and then we built up the north end and we built and installed permanent lighting and then we got to play a lot of hockey throughout the whole season with tons of great skating weather and minimal bad weather to deal with. Year three has been about getting the rink dialed in and spending a lot of time out there maintaining the ice. In the spring, I started by renting a Harley rake for the skid steer to help get the area as level as possible and that worked really well and helped prepare the area to plant some grass for summer activities where we throw quite a few footballs and baseballs around and play some spike ball. Now the grass started to come in a bit this summer and it should start to fill in better this year. In the fall, my buddy Dustin came over and helped make a trench from the house to the rink so we could run power out to it. Now in the past, I had run several hundred feet of extension cords all over the yard so burying the cable would really clean things up. Trench lines were dug to each light post. I then laid the wiring, filled in the trench, and had a sub panel wired up and some boxes at each light installed. Moving on to the rink assembly, I first measured out the approximate distances of 120 feet in length and 60 feet in width and then pounded in metal stakes at each location. I then adjusted the stakes as needed to ensure the rink would be squared up. Then string lines were run around the perimeter of the rink which will act as a guide for spray painting a line to help line up the boards in a later step. Hash marks were added at each corner to mark where the rounded corners would start and end. And then that completed the layout just in time for some hockey teammates to show up to help with the board install. Ed was the first to show up and we started to lay out all of the nice rink boards around the perimeter of the rink. Now growing up we always used plywood boards which work just fine, but the plastic boards are super durable, they don't warp or absorb water, so I just stack them up on a pallet and cover them with a tarp when not in use, and then they work great each year when I need them. Next we place the black plastic brackets around the sides which will hold the boards in place. Ed and my buddy Matt began assembling the first side of the rink, which basically involves pounding in the bracket, inserting the board, and then repeating the process. Now the soil here has a lot of clay in it, and so it is pretty hard, so it does take a little effort to get those stakes to go in the ground. And the pegs will go right into those holes once it's lined up and it slides into place. Easy as that. Now if your backyard has softer soil, the brackets are going to go in a lot easier, just like Tyler from Nice Rink shows here. Put the board forward, put your bracket right there, step that in. We continued putting up the boards and some more friends showed up and started putting up the other side. Pete, Dustin, Ed, and Matt have helped with the boards the past few years and it makes the process go quickly. It took us about two hours to get the boards up from start to finish on corners bracket. It felt really good to get the boards up early this year while the ground was still nice and dry and the soil wasn't frozen. I pounded in a stake at each corner so next year I won't need to measure out the area as long as I build the same size rink. The liner came in so I took it out to the rink and it was about perfect timing with the cold weather soon to be arriving so I cleared off the little bit of snow that was on the rink that afternoon and I planned on putting the liner in with some buddies after work the next day. 
I got up early the next morning and there was zero wind, so instead of waiting until the evening and taking a chance on those winds coming up, I decided to just try and put it in on my own. Now last year we had about four guys and the winds came up, so it was a lot of work to get in the liner, but without wind, it's not bad at all. I would work my way around the perimeter multiple times, pulling the liner taut and giving it a nice tight fit where it met up with the boards. There were a few feet of wiggle room on each side, but you'll want to try and center that liner as best as possible. Taking advantage of the early morning before the winds came up really helped make the install easy. I uncovered the yellow bumpers, took them over to the rink, and then put them over the top of the boards and liner to hold that liner in place in case the winds would come up. The bumpers kind of look like a beefed up version of a pool noodle, but they have a taller channel to fit the board in, and I feel like they give the rink a little bit more professional look, and they also are nice and soft in case someone were to fall on the boards. I temporarily installed the bumpers around the entire perimeter of the rink. We're continuing the tradition after the second year of a hockey rink, and so we're just taking some water that will go into the next year's rink, which will be the 2020-2021 season. We'll cap her off, and this will be the start of the next year's rink. Here's the water from last year's rink, and we're going to use it to start this year's. I turned on the water and began filling the rink. Now last year we used a combination of water from the well and water trucks, but after a well and water assessment, I decided to fill the entire rink this year using my well. Here's a look at the liner after a few hours of filling. The water of course flows to the lowest areas first, and then we'll move over the higher spots. I'd recommend checking the rink a few times a day while filling it to see that the liner lays down as flat as possible, and if you see any big creases or bubbles, try your best to get them out before there's too much water to do so. The next morning, the majority of the rink liner had water covering it. However, you can still see a few high spots poking up here and there. And after about 48 hours, every high point was completely covered. At this point, the weight of the water will have pulled the liner as tight as it's going to, so I like to add the kick plates at this time. The kick plates cover up the liner, giving the rink a professional look while protecting the liner and boards a bit more. Now to install, simply rest it on top of the board and then use a bumper to hold it in place. I power washed a few of the kick plates that had some mud on them and they cleaned up real nicely. Overlap each of the kick plates a couple inches and then secure it in place with the yellow bumper. I'd recommend overlapping each kick plate in the same direction so that it makes shoveling along the boards easier. Mine is set up so I can shovel around the whole perimeter going clockwise without catching a side of a kick plate if it sticks out a little. Here's the evening of day two and the weather is absolutely beautiful out. The rink was looking great. Now day three of filling, a system came in and blanketed the thin ice with some snow that wasn't even in the forecast. It created some slush that would ultimately freeze and I've had to deal with this situation in the past, but if it doesn't snow during the fill, it makes the process just a lot easier and quicker. Now, the snow will also insulate the ice, which takes it a little bit longer to freeze. In total, it took three and three-fourths days to fill this year's rink with an average depth of about six inches of water. I always try and get snow off the rink as soon as possible after any snowstorm, but I wasn't able to get on the ice until it was solid enough to walk on, which was about four days after the water was shut off. I did a little shoveling, but I decided it was ultimately still a little bit weak in some spots, so I ended up getting off the ice and I just let it be. Over the next few days, we had a warm spell and wind, which ended up melting all the snow, and it kind of prevented the rink from continuing to freeze solid. I shoveled around the sides to get as much of the slushy snow off as I could, and I tried to get some of the leaves and debris off that blew into some of the corners. 
The next afternoon, another system brought in some 60 mile per hour gusts that blew the bumpers right off since I hadn't completely trimmed the sides of the liner yet and the wind kind of caught it and blew it like a sail. But I put the bumpers back on and quick trim that liner. I knew this combination of puddles on the rink and a lot of wind and snow was not going to be good for the rink. The windblown slush unfortunately created ridges and bumps all over the ice, which were definitely going to be a challenge to fix. My luck with weather thus far hadn't been great, and I began to question if the rink was ever going to be ready to skate on. Um, but the only way to fix it was to get out there and to figure things out, so I first cleared as much snow off the bumpy ice as possible. I was able to see what I was going to be dealing with, and I planned to get started that next day when my dad could stop over to help. It snowed overnight, so I quick blew the snow off the rink and then used a hose and hot water to start working on the rink. I did some research online to come up with some ideas on the best way to fix a really bumpy and slushed up rink, and a couple of sites that are super helpful are BackyardIceRinks.org and NiceRink.com. Now both sites have a ton of information about backyard rinks, and they also have great Facebook communities with tons of members who share about their backyard rink building experiences, and they help fellow backyard rink builders like you and I with their questions. And one technique I came across to help with a really bumpy rink is called the bucket dump, so I decided to give it a shot. The idea of the bucket dump is to get a good amount of water on the rink as fast as possible so the water will naturally flow to those low spots and start filling them in. Now a garbage can or any large container will work. I used a four-wheeler trailer since it was easy to roll around and tilt. I found it to work really well actually and it's also nice because you can work on other things while the bucket or the trailer fills up with water. If you leave a hose running on the ice, even cold water will start to melt the ice after a few minutes, and you never have to worry about that issue with a bucket dump. My dad stopped over that afternoon to help out, and so we continued working on and fixing up the rink. While the trailer was filling with water, we used a propane weed torch to try and melt down the big ridge in the center of the rink a bit. And it worked all right, but it would take a really long time to completely try and melt it down. Now, as you can see, the weed torch does do a really good job with smaller bumps and the thin snowy areas and then helping with fixing air pockets. I upgraded the sound system this year with some new Atrium 6 outdoor speakers that hook up to an amp, and they sound great and they're so fun to have out at the rink for music. The rink looked so much better and was definitely on the right track after all of our work, and one of the things I love about backyard rinks is getting to spend time with family and friends, whether it's while skating or maintaining the rink, and growing up we did a backyard rink every winter starting in 1996. That evening, I went out and worked on melting down the ridge some more. It's going to take some time, but after some skating and a few more ice resurfaces, things will look pretty good. Alexa, turn on the hockey rink lights. The next morning, I tested out the rink to see how it would work for New Year's Eve, which was coming up soon, and it actually skated pretty decently for what we'd started out with. My buddy Travis came out to the rink to help put a thin layer of ice on with the resurfacer so we could get the rink ready for a night of skating. The nets were hung between the light poles on each end to help keep the pucks in, and then we began putting up some of the NHL and college team flags.
Britt and I finally got around to hanging up the other flags and then cleared the ice from the night previously. The snow all built up just from one night of skating. And as you can see, a metal shovel works really well for getting the surface as clean as possible and is what I like to do before resurfacing if I have time. However, the plastic shovels we have are four feet wide and so the process just goes a lot faster. My friend Brian has the same size rink as mine, and here you can see his son Zach using a power sweeper to get the ice perfectly clear of defects before resurfacing the ice. Now Brian said this machine is a game changer and really will make the ice at your rink a lot smoother. Plus it's what he uses to remove the snow when it is just a couple inches or less. So that might be an accessory to look into if you're a serious backyard rink enthusiast and wanna up your game in ice quality. One thing you'll find out right away as a backyard rink builder is that anything on the ice will absorb energy from the sun and in turn melt into the ice. Now I set these pucks on the ice for about an hour on a sunny 25 degree day and they already sunk in about a half inch or about 1.3 centimeters for you metric folks. It's real easy to fix those areas by simply filling them with some snow, adding a little water to make it a slushy mixture, packing it and then smoothing it over with a puck and letting it freeze overnight. The same method can be used for goal marks, for cracks in the ice, and where leaves blow in. Things like leaves, dirt, and debris all absorb energy and they'll put holes in the ice, so get them out if you can. We had a lot of what I would call interesting weather fronts come through the season, and wind seemed to be a very common theme. Now warm temperatures and 68 mile per hour winds puddled up the ice quickly and blew benches and goals around and then it seems like a warm day would usually follow with more wind and lots of snow. I put on my boots and got ready to start clearing some snow. I have a few machines to help move snow around the property and for helping out my neighbors. So I thought I'd try out each on the rink and show you how they would work out on a rink and which ones are needed for different conditions. We'll start out with the older 28 inch wide snowblower that came with my house when I bought it. And as you can see, this snowblower does a great job getting down to the surface when the snow is light and powdery. And as long as the snow hasn't compacted too much from the wind, it works great out on the ice and it's very efficient. This 60 inch wide ATV and UTV snowblower is a new addition this year and I bought it in hopes that I could bust through deep and compacted drifts without having to use the heavy skid steer and to have something a little wider than the walk behind snowblower. Now it seems to throw snow pretty well but it's hard to maneuver the ATV in the snow with this giant attachment on it. It's hard to turn and I've had a few other issues with it already so I haven't honestly wanted to use it that much. Now we'll bring out the beast and show you how it works. The 84 inch wide snowblower is like a tank and it works great for clearing deep and wind blown snow. I only use it once the ice is completely solid all the way through since the skid steer and blower weigh a combined at 9,000 pounds. Now I've used it the last two years and I haven't had too many issues with additional cracking or anything with the ice. Um, and I basically only use it if the snow is so wind blown that it can't be removed with the walk behind blower. One of the downsides of the heavy equipment is that it's hard to get as clean a finish against the ice and so any snow that doesn't get picked up or that gets run over with the wheels compresses and can bond with the ice. Especially if the sun is out, it'll bake it to the ice and in comparison, the walk behind blower is easy to get a nice close finish and it doesn't compress the snow. And I actually just got a power sweeper to help clear off compressed snow in case this happens more often, but I haven't had a chance to use it in those conditions yet, so you'll see that next year. My buddy Dayton gave me an instant portable hot water heater to use out at the rink, and it's been a great tool for helping maintain the ice. When water is drawn, the heater uses propane to instantly heat the water, which helps melt the bumps and is nice to have, although I have used cold water for many years, and that will work fine too. Here I'm dealing with the compressed snow I couldn't get all the way off, so the hot water actually does help a lot in melting the snow. Over the next couple days we had the biggest snow and windstorm of the season, and I was starting to get a little over all this weather we've been getting, as every storm means more work to clean off the rink, and this was definitely going to be a lot of work. Alright, well the storm has cleared and uh, 
Let's take a look. It's really blown in this time. I took out the walk behind snowblower to see how it would do and the snow was so wind blown and compressed that it just walked on top of the snow. Now, if that was the only option I'd had to clear the rink, I'd probably have given up for the year. I got out the heavy equipment, which is essential for a rink like this, which is built at 5,285 feet in the foothills of the Rocky Mountains where the wind tends to rip like crazy through the valley. And it took me about two and a half hours just on the skid steer to move all of this compressed snow out of the way. The snow was so deep in the corner that I couldn't see the boards and I ended up bumping the corner so I'll have to fix that when I get a chance. Now the wind blows from the west probably about 70% of the time and then when it blows from the east is when it gets the highest winds and the snow really compresses. So next year I'm going to see if I can figure out the most strategic spots to set up snow fences um, just to see if I can minimize the drifting a little. After running the larger snow blower, I'll clean everything up and go along the sides with the walk behind blower. It ended up being a full day out on the rink and I was pretty exhausted by the end of the day, but it felt good to have the rink back under control and to know that we'd be able to skate soon. It snowed the next morning, so Britt got out the snowblower and cleared the rink. And when there's just a couple inches, it only takes about a half hour or so to clear the rink, so it's really not that bad. I replaced a few flags that had been damaged from all the wind in the latest storm. Next, I got to put up some brand new flags. Peter, a subscriber from New Hampshire, sent a Boston Bruins flag, so I put that up. And Dave, another subscriber and a hockey fan, sent an LA Kings flag, so I put that up as well. When the ice is in more of a routine maintenance mode, I like to use the Backyard DIY Zamboni setup because it's a lot more fun to do, it's quick, and it can eliminate the need to haul hoses out to the rink. Now a lot of backyard builders will rig up a tank and piping to the back of a UTV like a Ranger or a Gator for those with larger sized rinks. And that is really easy to do and it works well. And I usually use about two 65 gallon tanks to resurface the ice. Since the ice was still pretty rough before doing the first coat with the UTV, I got out the Minnesota Wild themed tractor Zamboni I had built last year and I did a thin second coat. Now this machine is smaller so it's easier to get close to the edges and the corners with it and if you're interested in checking out that build I'll link to it in the description below. The other method a lot of backyard builders use is a resurfacer similar to this one that hooks up to a hose. They work great, you just have to deal with hoses which involves running 300 feet of hose in my case, but if you don't have to run a lot of hose, it's quite a bit easier. A lot of folks ask what happens to the rink when spring comes around, so I'll show last year's takedown. The ice all melts and a lot of the water will evaporate and will then take down the boards, remove the liner, and the water runs out the sides and gets absorbed back into the earth. While this all may seem like a lot of work, it's all worth it in the end and it's something us rink builders look forward to every year. And if you aren't building your rink at a mile high in elevation in the foothills of the Rocky Mountains, there's a very good chance that your rink maintenance is going to be very, very minimal compared to this rink. But I hope it still gives you some tips and ideas on methods to help maintain your rink, no matter how big or small it may be. There are tons of resources to help and inspire rink builders and hockey players, so I wanted to share a few of my favorites with you.
Coach Jeremy from How To Hockey has all sorts of hockey drill and training videos on his website and on YouTube to help you or your son or daughter become better hockey players. He's also a backyard rink builder and documents his videos on YouTube, so check out his channel if you'd like to learn more. Outdoor Rink Heaven, or ODR Heaven, is an inspiring Instagram channel with incredible photos of outdoor rinks and beautiful lakes people skate on all over the world. Pete with ElevatedHockey.com puts on hockey development camps around the world, shares drills on Instagram, and has a great podcast for coaches and players. Lastly, if you're in the market for a hockey rink setup, consider Nice Rink Boards and Liners as they make awesome products. They're a family-owned company based out of Wisconsin, and the father-son duo of Jim and Tyler are just all-around good people. One of the best things that comes out of making these rink videos is getting to hear from you guys and to see your rink builds. And Warren, a subscriber from Winnipeg, shared some photos of his rink setup and his real Zamboni in his backyard. It's always fun to see your rink setups and to hear about your builds. So tell us about what you have going on in the comments below. All right, thanks so much for tuning in and watching year three of the Backyard Hockey Rink Build. If you enjoyed the video or found it helpful, please consider subscribing and giving it a thumbs up. And I'd love to hear about your experiences with hockey, with backyard hockey rinks, or with building and maintaining one. So please share those in the comments below. All right, thanks again for watching and cheers from Montana.